Welcome. Uh, my name is Dave Platorek. Um, we're going to cover Microsoft System Center Service Manager 2012. Uh, we're just going to give you a quick implementation briefing. Um, basically, we're going to cover what's new and improved in System Center Service Manager 2012. We've had a, look, a chance to get our fingernails dirty, having a look at the product, um, uh, and carefully examining uh, the new prerequisites, uh, the new uh, integration, and uh, as well as new and improved functionality. Um, and we're going to cover those pieces for you. And then, based on our experience implementing uh, System Center Service Manager and our look at the new product um, in beta, we are um, uh, going to make some recommendations in terms of how to prepare. I mean, really, what this is about today is you've got some months. You know, the official date for release is uh, first half of 2012. You've got some time before the product's actually here. There are some long lead time items you need to, to tick off to make sure you're ready and, and it, things go smoothly. So based on our experience implementing 2010, moving to production, et cetera, we're going to talk about an upgrade path, a roadmap there, as well as considerations when planning to implement or migrating uh, if you already are running 2010. So today's presenters are Nick Dottillo and Pete Quagliarello. Nick and Pete are two of our uh, leading consultants. They have done a leading number of, of implementations, some of the larger and um, most complex uh, implementations that have been done. So um, without further ado, I just want to turn it over to Nick and Pete to take you through what's new and improved. Thanks, Dave. Hey, this is Pete Quayarella. And uh, Nick, you want to say hi for a sec? Yep. Hi, guys. This is Nick Attila. So yeah, as Dave said, we, we want to take you through a lot of different things. Um, and there is a lot to go through. Service Manager 2010 is it's a pretty big product, and 2012 is, uh, I think, arguably even bigger. So uh, we're still exploring and experimenting with the beta version ourselves. Um, what we want to do today is we want to take you through some things that we think are notable and interesting. Um, again, we're still uh, discovering, and uh, we still have our own questions about things. So. Our objective today, like I say, is to, to take you guys through some things, let you see some of what's new, give you some things to think about as you start to experiment and explore yourselves. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at the prereqs. And Nick, why don't you take this? Yeah, absolutely, Pete. So um, we wanted to kick off by looking at the prerequisites. We thought this was a good starting place for you guys to start thinking about some of the things that you might need to change in your current environment if you're running 2010 uh, or if you're new to the service manager product to give you an idea of the types of hardware and software that are going to be required um, to implement this this product. So we wanted to start with the hardware requirements. So the minimum hardware requirements have not changed since the 2010 version of the product. Um, so ultimately, I think what that means to us is if you've got 2010 running in a current environment, you should be able to upgrade and, and have a performance system without changing any of the hardware. Um, there have been improvements made to the performance of the product to so better console response. Are you connected to a mailbox right now? No. And, uh, and part of that is also a scaling. So the product can now scale up to 50,000 users. Uh, that does require additional hardware uh, capacity, but it can now scale up to 50,000 users with, with the adequate hardware. Uh, now, that being said, there have been some changes to the software prerequisites for Service Manager. Um, so we wanted to walk through. This doesn't cover all of them, but this covers the ones that we thought in our minds were the biggest changes, um, things that might have the most implications for our clients. Um, so we'd like to share those with you. Um, we'll start with the client. Um, one of the biggest changes that we think uh, in, in terms of prerequisite changes is the uh, Service Manager console is no longer compatible or no longer supported uh, on Windows XP. So the console uh, must be installed then on uh, Windows Vista Service Pack 2 or Windows 7 Professional or Ultimate Service Pack 1. Um, so we think this is probably one of the prerequisite changes that's going to have the largest impact on folks. Um, there are workarounds to this particular issue. For instance, you can use terminal services to provide um, the console to, to folks whose client machines are running Windows XP. Um, and of course, the client would only uh, typically be rolled out to analysts and folks who are directly involved with using Service Manager on a day-to-day -day basis. So 
if you can support upgrading a subset of your users to, to Windows 7. Um, that would be that would be possible as well. Um, client machines will also need to have Serverlite 4 installed, so we're going to talk a little bit later about the changes that have been made to the self-service portal. It does now run on uh, SharePoint 2010, um, and as such, you'll need Silverlight 4 on the clients who are connecting to the portal. The, uh, the management servers for both the, um, the regular management server and the data warehouse management server have uh, upgraded prerequisites as well. They both require Windows Server 2008 R2 SV1. And because the data warehouse is now uh, taking advantage of SQL Server Analysis Services, you'll need Microsoft Analysis Management Objects and Analysis Servers, SSAS, installed in order to take advantage of that. That's required for the data warehouse. Both of those servers will also require PowerShell 2.0, which is part of the standard install if you're using Windows Server 2008 R2. Um, and you can manually update it if, if, you're, if you're not at that uh, server level. And Nick, uh, one, of the, one of the questions I'm sure a lot of people are going to ask is, what about a web-based client? Yeah, and, and that's a good question. Well, the, the, the portal has been uh, upgraded from the old portal. It's actually been completely revamped um, to work on the SharePoint uh, infrastructure, and it offers much more functionality than the, the portal that we had in the 2010 version. Uh, it still is not a replacement for the full console, and there still uh, isn't any talk that I've heard of so far from Microsoft about implementing a full web-based client or web-based console for Service Manager. So folks who need full access to the console will still need to, to have the local console installed or, or have terminal access to, to a console if it's on another machine. Okay. So the next thing we wanted to talk about then was the, uh, the integration. So the integration between Service Manager and the rest of the System Center products has always been an integral to, to the product. It's been one of the biggest advantages that Service Manager has over other products is the ease of which you can integrate with um, Operations Manager, Active Directory, Configuration Manager, and other System Center products. Um, so on that, Microsoft has made um, a number of improvements to both the existing integration and they've also added support for new integrations. So in Service Manager 2010, uh, what we had was an Active Directory connector, some Operations Manager connectors, and a Configuration Manager connector. And all three of those things have, have all been upgraded. So with Active Directory, we now get the capability of using LDAP queries to filter the content that comes, the objects that come from Active Directory into Service Manager. Um, that's that's a an improvement over the uh, 2010 version in that before, practically, your choices were either an entire domain or an entire OU, uh, and you could filter by individual objects, which was practically not usually possible for most of our clients, frankly. So this is going to make it a little bit easier to just bring the data that's relevant to your service manager infrastructure into the CMDB. So we can leave out all of the AD accounts for servers that have been decommissioned that might still be there, or for users that have left the company and, and they're still in a group for deactivated accounts. We can leave all of that out and just bring over the data that we need uh, with a lot more ease than we could before. Uh, Operations Manager and Configuration Manager connectors have both been upgraded, um, mostly to support the new functionality that's going to be available in the 2012 releases of those versions. Um, and the Exchange Connector has also been is also being upgraded. The Exchange Connector isn't currently available for the beta release of the product, um, and there is no official sort of set of features that have been released for that yet. Um, as you guys might know, that was a, a an unsupported add-on to Service Manager before it was developed and distributed by Microsoft, but not uh, not officially supported. So we don't have a good picture right now, or I don't have a good picture right now about whether the support for that's going to change with the 2012 release of the products. But we do know that there is talk of uh, improving features, things like being able to select a template when you resolve an incident through email, um, support for Office 365, which is going to be interesting for some of our clients. So there are improvements being invested there as well. All right, and um, and with that, uh, like I had mentioned, there is also going to be connectors to new System Center products. 
primarily around virtual machine manager and system center orchestrator, which is the rebranding of Opalis. Um, so these connectors will only be with the 2012 versions of these new products. Um, but what it's going to, to enable is, is pretty powerful stuff. So what we get from Virtual Machine Manager now is we'll bring across all of the VMM library data and objects and things like virtual machines themselves and data about the virtual machines that wasn't available for, before, like their hosts, um, private clouds, logical networks, things like that. So before we were getting that data into Service Manager, but it was coming through Active Directory or uh, Operations Manager usually. So we just had the very basic sort of server data about them and nothing specific to, you know, the fact that they are VMs and, and, and therefore they have special characteristics. Um, so with having that data in conjunction with uh, uh, Microsoft's Cancero uh, portal, which is still in very early, uh, you know, sort of life cycle of its development phase, right now, so there isn't a whole lot of, I think, official information out about that, but it's essentially a cloud management uh, portal. Uh, and that, um, we think, is going to be able to be used in conjunction with the service manager portal to deploy, manage, and operate virtual machines. So that's going to enable a lot of, of sort of self-service capability there with managing VMs in your VMM environment. Now, the orchestrator connector uh, is also going to have some, some big implications for our service manager implementations. And, and what's going to happen there is runbooks that are developed in Orchestrator are going to be brought into Service Manager. And what that means is we can now invoke runbooks from within Service Manager, which is a change from how it was before. Um, before, Opalis and Service Manager could work in conjunction, but Service Manager had no awareness of Opalis. So all of the workflow triggering had to happen on the Opalis side and it was a little bit of a workaround to get data to pass between the two products. Now the integration is, is much more rich and, and much more fully integrated, so we'll be able to pass and trigger workflows and pass parameters from Service Manager into Orchestrator. And now since Orchestrator also integrates with the rest of the System Center products, like SCUM, ConfigMan, VMM, and also third-party applications, things like VMware and other tools, it means that we can really get cross-platform automation um, while still having folks go to the service manager portal for that self-service experience, but we can propagate that out to much more than just service manager specific tasks. It can do things in Active Directory or Exchange or any of the other system center products, which really enables that kind of cross-platform automation. Cool. Thanks, Nick. Yeah. Hey, Dave, just a quick question on procedure here for questions. Uh, I, we're going to try to leave some time at the end. Do you want folks to use the Q&A function in live meeting to, to submit questions that we can take at the end? That's absolutely right. Um, we're going to queue those up. If there's questions that uh, can be answered now, like, for example, someone asked, are there going to be a, a copy of the presentation or recording? Uh, we'll answer them in stream. Scott's running that, but all the ones that are content related, we're going to queue up to the end. Um, so, but just to, to comment, if you uh, look in the upper right hand corner of your screen, there's a looks like what looks like three sheets of paper. That's where the handouts are. Um, and you'll see that the uh, this presentation is up there in PDF format already. Uh, at the conclusion of this presentation, um, the uh, uh, recording will be or will be available to you. Uh, all, all at the registration page, um, and um, yeah, one one other request is please keep your microphones muted as we move forward through the presentation. Thanks. Good. Thank you. All right. So we we talked a bit about the the prerequisites, and, and Nick gave us a nice summary of some of the the new and improved features around integration. So now we want to look at what's new and improved in terms of functionality. And, and back to my earlier comment, we're not going to cover every single piece of new and improved functionality. Um, we've given you here what we think is a, uh, is a, a decent summary, and, um, and we're still digging into this ourselves. So hopefully we'll give you some, some information here and also some things to think about and some things to try if you guys are uh, exploring the the beta yourself. We're going to 
Uh, in this part of the presentation, we're going to talk about these six areas. Incident management, service level management, which I'm sure a lot of people are eager to learn about as, uh, as they are, I'm sure, with service request fulfillment. Um, we're going to talk about some of the changes in end user self-service, as well as some of the, the new and improved features in reporting and analytics. And then we're going to talk about change and release management, change being something I think most folks are probably familiar with. If you're familiar with 2010, release management being a, a new feature. So for incident management, you know, every service manager customer that we have uses Service Manager for incident management. And there are some really nice new features here. I think probably one of the most prominent new features is this parent-child uh, incident functionality, which you could use, let's say, if you were going to uh, report a major incident. You wanted to have one parent incident record, and you wanted to associate um, related cases, related incidents to that. Uh, or if you just wanted to, to, for whatever reason, batch your incidents together and roll them all up to a parent. Uh, it's easy to do that. What you can see here is in the, um, it kind of like it does currently in the activity, you can see the, 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 uh, the parent record number here. And you also have some, uh, some global options here in incident settings. Uh, on how you are going to handle the resolution of child incidents, the reactivation of child incidents, and then the status of child incidents relative to the parent. Uh, and you've got some nice options here. So, you know, you, you can decide exactly how you want to handle these. Um, another thing that, uh, that we think is pretty cool, um, this is something that a number of our customers have, uh, have been eager to have, and that's the ability to, to set a response date and time in the record. You'll notice here, this is not the full incident task pane. This is just a, just a little um, part of the, the incident task pane, which you can see at the bottom here, set first response or comment. This will just pop up a box and allow you to put a comment in, but it will also allow you to flag the incident as being responded to. And you'll see when we get into the uh, service level management functionality. You can see how that can be used. So I think that's a, that's a pretty cool feature. Um, another couple of things, I, I don't have them uh, on slides here, but I wanted to point them out. They're, they're arguably small, but I, I think they're nice conveniences. Um, it's a little bit difficult to see here, but what you can see in the affected user picker here is we're seeing a little bit more information than we're used to. We're seeing the, uh, the domain, we're seeing the display name, and if, if we could stretch this out, we'd see the username as well. And, and I think that's a, a nice feature. We've had a number of customers who, uh, who need to use username as a unique identifier in large organizations where you have a lot of people with the same name. Um, I think it also comes in handy where you've got um, users that have, uh, IT users who have uh, administrative accounts. And a lot of times you'll see the same person listed two or three times because they've got their regular account and then they've got one or two sets of administrative credentials. So this should help to distinguish that. Um, another thing that, uh, and Nick, maybe I can ask you to explain um, the, uh, the affected user I'm sorry, the assigned to user uh, and primary owner pickers are going to operate a little bit differently in 2012? Yes, yeah. So what we have with, with the assigned to user, uh, with the primary owner for incidents, um, previously what we had is that the list of users we were picking from were all of the users that were brought in from Active Directory. Uh, and that includes, obviously, users that are outside of IT. Um, and, and again, duplicate accounts, things like privileged accounts for certain users or, or you know, accounts for folks that have left the company but are deactivated but still present in Active Directory. So um, what we're able to do now is we have this uh, global operator group, and we can now add users into that group. And the uh, assigned to user, the primary owner, and also the activity implementer, so the assigned to user on an activity, it limits the scope of those fields then to just that set of users. So it's a flat list um, for all three of those relationships. Uh, it doesn't have any sort of relationship to the support group or anything like that, but it is a big step forward in terms of narrowing down the, 
the list of folks that we have to choose from to, to assign tickets at, which is really where most of the interaction is with the uh, user pickers and the assignment of incidents and, and things like that. So that's that's a big step forward. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's a nice feature. I think folks are going to you know, find that beneficial. Um, yeah. And that's that's a lot of the improvements that have been made. Um, these small things that we we've sort of are trying to roll up here are just small improvements that really improve the end user experience for folks who are working in and out of the console. You know, one of the other things that we've got is the um, the list values for parent and child list values. What we what we had before is if you had a, a, a list value like incident classification, you may have a few different things like software, hardware, um, networking, and then you could have child children list values of each of those things. So for software, you might have enterprise application or client, and then other. And under hardware, you could have hard drive, motherboard, you know, memory, and other. And if you chose the software other or the hardware other, there was no way to really know that by looking at the form because it just came up as other. So what has been done in, in Service Manager 2012 then is we can see both the parent objects and all of the child objects as far as you drill down. You can see all of those in the field together now. So you know if you're looking at an other that it's a child of software as opposed to one of the other parent list values. So that's another improvement that they've made. And also the introduction of keyboard shortcuts uh, in order to, to do certain actions just on the keyboard as with any data entry intensive application, especially for folks on the service desk who are in and out of the console much more frequently uh, in their day to day. It's, a, it's an improvement. It's a small thing that will help make lives a little bit easier for folks who, who do have more data entry intensive roles. Yeah, definitely. I, I think it'll, it'll definitely be a nice convenience or a nice set of conveniences. Um, along those lines, one more thing to point out is one thing you're going to be able to do now, uh, I don't think this is a big deal, but I do think it's nice, is you'll be able to create an incident from a template, kind of like you do with a change now. If you're used to Service Manager 2010, you know that in an incident you'll open the incident form, then you can apply a template, and you can still do that, but you'll also be able to just simply start the incident from a template. So again, you know, convenience, but I think that that, that can be nice. Uh, this is something we're going to look at um, in a little bit more detail in subsequent slides, but we wanted to show you here what service level management looks like in the incident. So you can see here, uh, we've got our tabs across the top, and all of these are familiar except for our service level management tab, which is new, and you can see here uh, this happens to be a Priority 2 incident. You can see we've got two Priority 2 incident SLOs, and that's the, the term that's used in Service Manager 2012, Service Level Objective. So we've got, uh, we've got two of these. We've got a, a resolve and a response. So I, I mentioned response earlier, so you can see that I've actually been able to incorporate it here into an SLO. Got my targets. I can see how long before these breach. Um, cancellation just refers to, let's say I reprioritize this incident, um, say I downgraded to priority three, it would cancel these SLOs, and then it, uh, presumably if I had created similar priority three SLOs, it would then make them active. So this is something that we're going to take a look at these, these SLOs in a little bit more detail in the next couple of slides, but I know a lot of people have been looking for this feature. So, We've got a, a couple of different parts to the, uh, the SLO in Service Manager 2012. And some of this may be familiar to you from seeing other products. Uh, we've got a configurable calendar now, or set of calendars. We can have more than one calendar. We've got the 24-7 calendar slash clock in Service Manager 2010. We can now have in addition to a 24-hour calendar, we can have a business hour calendar. This is an example where we just do Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. We can choose a time zone. A um, number of our customers span different time zones, and so time zone becomes important uh, to, to these business hour calendars. And of course, we can put our, our holidays in. You could also have a standard uh, U.S. business hour calendar, standard Canadian business hour calendar, UK business hour calendar. 
Uh, I'm sure there's a limit on the number of calendars you have. Um, I'm not certain what that is, but I also don't think that uh, you probably easily get near that limit. And then we've got a couple of other pieces to this. Um, we've got configurable metrics. So if we think about response time, I, I showed that example before. I showed you how you can now very easily go in and record an initial response on an incident. I can then come in and I can create a metric here. And I can say that I want response time to be the difference between the first response date and the created date for the incident. And what it allows you to do, basically, is to pick any date combination that you want within. Um, and it's not just the incident class. Um, I don't know if, Nick, you've had a chance to look. I think it's just it's, it's getting these from uh, from the, the work item class. Yeah, yeah, basically. So while you don't have a, a service level uh, tab on every form, you can assign service level objectives to any class if you needed to. So if you had or you wanted to track um, service level objectives um, or even just the metrics for, for a change or, or something like that, it is possible. You don't get a form for everything, and, it's, and it really is more applicable to, to incident and service requests than it is to the other work items. But you can choose any date property from any work item uh, here. Yeah, it's really nice. It's flexible. And and then we can kind of roll all of that into these configurable service level objectives. So what we've done here is we've set up our priority two incident response service level objective. And what we're, what we're doing here is, and uh, I don't have everything uh, displayed here, the main thing I wanted to show is that we're, we're basing this on queues. I don't know how many people have had an opportunity to work with queues in Service Manager 2010. Um, I think they're going to be, because of this, they're going to be much more relevant in 2012. I've simply gone and created priority-based queues, but if you're familiar with the concept of the queue in Service Manager, you, you know that it's just a group of like work items, a group of incidents, a group of um, change requests, et cetera. Um, and we can set criteria in them to determine what actually gets included in the queue. So again, you can imagine here I've just said, give me anything that's set to priority two. Um, the, the different things you can do with queues, you know, the way you could configure them um, are uh, pretty limitless, I guess. Uh, it doesn't have to be priority. It could be based on support group. Uh, it could be based on um, incidents that have a certain affected item or a certain affected service. Uh, then what I've done here, again, I, I don't have it displayed, but then I've connected that to this metric, and that's how I'm getting to that target that we saw on the incident screenshot a couple of slides ago. Uh, and as you saw, we had a couple of different SLOs on there. So we, you know, we can do response time. We can do, obviously, time to resolve. We could also do uh, time to the first assignment. Um, this will provide um, a lot of nice flexibility around service levels, and this, this stuff is, is pretty straightforward to configure. Yeah, another thing about the queues there, too, which is kind of cool, is you can uh, configure queues in such a way that you can call out VIP users or, or high priority configuration items. So since you can create a queue for incidents that are affecting certain users or servers, you can set tighter SLAs or apply different business calendars to those servers or, or people. So if it's an exchange server and it goes down over the weekend and you're a 24-hour business, you know, you can apply a 24-hour clock to that server because you need to get email back up. Or if it's a VIP user like, you know, the CIO is requesting something or, or needs help with something, you can have tighter timelines for, for helping those types of users than for the, the general business, for example. Yeah, and, we, and we've, we've um, flagged VIP users in the past um, by extending the, the user class. And, and as Nick said, now we can do something very, very practical with that. Yeah. So I think one of the natural follow-ons to having this, this enhanced service level management capability is enhanced notification subscription capability. Um, and this, we think, is, is pretty nice. Um, we've got a new 
option here, a new when to notify option. Periodically notify when objects meet a criteria. So what you're used to now is for work items, when a work item is updated, when a work item is created, I think we can do um, uh, deletion for CIs. Now we can notify periodically. And what you see here, I've just given an example criteria of uh, a target warning date in SLA less than or equal to now and a 15-minute notification interval. Uh, we can also specify the range of recurrence. I don't know that we necessarily want no end date, as we've got here in the screenshot. We can end after a, you know, after a specified number of occurrences. So I, I think that'll be nice. We've, we've set up notifications like this for customers, but we've, we've done it as, as a customization, as a custom workflow. You'll now be able to do something like this right in the console, which I think is, again, very, very convenient. Um, Another thing that you can do now in a notification subscription, and it's probably worth saying that what we're talking about now is the, the subscription that is in the uh, uh, notifications um, uh, item in the administration workspace. Uh, we're not talking about the email notification that you can send as a workflow, which hopefully will make sense to, to folks who are familiar with Service Manager 2010. Um, in the subscription, currently, we cannot reference a related recipient. We can do that now in 2012. So we can reference not just a specific user, like send an email to Nick Petillo, send an email to Pete Quagliarello. We can also reference one of the relationships, like assigned to user, primary owner. And one of the things I'm thinking, Nick, is you could kind of build on, I think, the example you gave earlier, we could, if we had a priority one incident, um, if we had an owner for a CI, we could, I believe we could reference that relationship in the subscription and we could email the owner of the CI that there's a priority one incident on a CI that they own. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, probably a pretty common use case. And, and yeah, and, and I think this is another example of, of how the changes that have been made, some of the changes that have been made have been very significant, but some of them are small like being able to notify related recipients in the same place that you notify static recipients. You used to have to, like Pete said, go to a different area of the console. But I think it makes a difference um, just in terms of how easy it is to, to do your initial configuration or your ongoing maintenance. Um, it's probably worth mentioning that you can still uh, notify recipients in the workflow area in Service Manager 2012. That Right. A set of forms will look familiar to you if you're used to 2010. You've got the same functionality, but you can also notify related recipients in the subscription space as well. Now, and I, looking at that, I don't believe that there's a, a periodic notification capability there. That, I believe, is still limited to, to create an update. Okay, yeah. I don't know, yeah, if you've tried, I, I'm, I'm pretty certain that's the case. Okay, yeah, I, I haven't seen, but, but it's good to know. Makes sense. So um, service request fulfillment. So this is something that I think a lot of people have been anticipating. This is the service request work item or the form for the service request work item, which I think of as kind of a cross between um, an incident and a change. Um, you know, just a couple of things to notice about it. It's uh, the, the tab structure is similar to incident. We do have our service levels here, and we could do through the SLO functionality we looked at a few minutes ago, we could do uh, customized set of service levels for service requests. Um, we have a little bit different prioritization scheme than the incident. This is more like when you look at um, priority area. This reminds you more of uh, the change request work item. So you're not going to have a numeric priority for the service request, which I think is probably fine. Um, this is just that Nick had, had touched on this earlier. You can see this parent-child list value here, so software slash application, just to give you an idea of what that, what that looks like on the screen. Um, I, a lot of our customers are anxious for this because they do a lot of service requests. We've had a couple of customers that do more requests than they do incidents, so this will be um, I'm sure more than a nice convenience for them, but you know this is only one part of the overall request fulfillment capability in Service Manager 2012. 
what they've also added is uh, a service catalog uh, that contains a couple of different offering types. So that the catalog is, is, as you might expect, is all of the IT services that are available to consumers. The offerings then end up being the kind of categorical, you know, desktop services, messaging, connectivity. And then the request offerings are the individual self-serviceable items that reside within that offering. So Nick, I don't know if you want to make any comments about this slide, or I know you've got another slide prepared that's going to try to kind of tie some of this together and maybe give some examples about how you might use this. Yeah, I think the, the, the only other thing I wanted to mention before we move on to the next slide is just that we, we have in the past had to deal with the, the lack of the this discrete service request work item. And we've done a number of, of workarounds in order to, to make it fit, um, but none of which have obviously been, been ideal. You, we, we've borrowed the change request or the incident work item. Um, then we have to do some sharing of impact and urgency to get a different priority scheme for service requests than we have from incidents, because obviously your time to resolve on or or action on service requests, you probably would want to be different on your incidents. So even just the the existence of its own work item is going to be great from a reporting point of view. It'll make life a lot easier there. And, and from a functional point of view, if folks are actually going in and actioning these things, um, it's going to make, make life a lot easier there as well. So I have this slide here. And, and really what we're trying to do here is, is roll up what the service catalog ultimately is going to mean to folks that implement Service Manager and, and any number of the other System Center products. So the service catalog is, is really sort of a big topic. And depending on how you want to use Service Manager, it, it probably can be the biggest topic in your implementation, the biggest area that you'll, that you'll have to invest time sort of discussing what you're going to need and how you're going to take advantage of the functionality that you have. It's, it's very, very versatile. It's very flexible. Um, but that also makes it uh, somewhat open-ended. So there, it, it'll take a little bit more thought up front um, in order to get these things together. So you know, the, the service catalog is in Service Manager, similar to the concept in idle terms. Um, but since Service Manager is a tool that allows us to both manage work and use other complementary tools to automate some of the work, it, it goes much further than, than just the, the general definition of, of service catalog. And there's a number of different use cases that we've seen here. And, and probably the best way to figure out how much of the service request fulfillment functionality you need to leverage is by defining what the common use cases in your environment are going to be. Um, so among others, I, we, I've sort of identified three of the big uh, sort of areas that you probably can look to this to, to serve you. Um, there's the simple uh, sort of straightforward service requests. Things like I need a piece of software installed on my computer or my mailbox is full and I need more storage on exchange for my mailbox. Um, things that are that are small in nature, they're finite and, and can be actioned easily. There's, there's sort of typical day-to-day -day types of requests that most service desks get. Um, then there's the, the sort of more uh, complex requests, things that you can take and use the integration that Service Manager has innately with the other System Center products. It can get very, very um, sophisticated with the types of requests that you can handle. So using the Service Manager integration with VMN, with Operations Manager and Orchestrator, for instance, you can have a scenario where a server is approaching its capacity on its hard drive space. Uh, operations manager can alert, generate an alert about that, which can create an incident in service manager, letting the owner of that CI know that they need to do something about that. They could then use the service manager portal to request additional hard drive space or to expand the virtual hard drive on this particular VM. Um, and if you wanted to, you could use the, the built-in approval uh, functionality in Service Manager, which is, is strong, it's very strong, um, to make sure that you're still not letting things get through the cracks. And it's one of the things you need to be careful with when you start to introduce automation into your environment is making sure that you still have visibility and control. Um, but Service Manager handles that pretty well with its 
review activities and the ability to make sure that uh, the right approvals are happening before things are actually action. And we'll talk about the visibility later with the data warehouse and reporting you can do. But you can have Orchestrator go and, and actually do that work for you after some sort of approval scheme. Because Orchestrator integrates with both Service Manager and VMM, it can go out and shut down the virtual machine and expand the hard drive and start it back up. And then let Service Manager know it's done. And Service Manager can in turn let the analyst know that his CI's server is back up, it's got the larger hard drive, everything was successful. And he can go and, and um, you know, even Operations Manager at that point could close the incident in Service Manager because it'll see that the, the hard drive isn't at capacity anymore. So that's kind of a small example of, of the different types of things that you can do. Um, the third area with the service catalog, uh, and, and not so much the service catalog, this is a little bit separate. This is more on the self-service point of view, which the service catalog, catalog in part enables. Um, but it enables self-service analytics. So we're going to touch on the data warehouse next, and uh, or in, uh, in a little bit after we, we go through the release management. Um, but it, it allows ad hoc reporting capability with tools that you're familiar with. So I think I'll wait till we get to there to get into more detail with that. But I just wanted to round that out to say that it's it's not just the request that it's enabling self service of, it's also the analytics and the reporting and things like that. Yeah, and, and just in the interest of time, um, we're going to move a little quickly through the next couple of items. And, and I'll be honest in that, you know, we haven't really dug into these um, as we've worked with 2012 as deeply as we, we could. Um, that's release management. You can see the, the release uh, record work item here. Um, as you can imagine, there's going to be uh, integration between releases and changes. Um, activities will play into this as well. And this is one that we're looking forward to, to really uh, exploring a lot more closely. We haven't done a whole heck of a lot with it now. One of the things that we do like and that we definitely wanted to point out was the fact that uh, you can now specify downtime. You can do this in the release. You can also do this in some of the activities. Um, this is nice. We've had a number of, of customers who've wanted to be able to say, hey, I just want to, I, I want to be able to distinguish between the start and end of the change, which may extend over a, a long period of time, and the very, very, very small window of downtime, you know, that might only be an hour or a few hours. Um, the other thing that we can do in a release, I, I, get, I should say we, we can use it in a release. This is actually, I think, a function of the CIs is to, uh, is to specify builds and environments. Nick, if you could just touch on that very, very quickly, and then I want to hit um, activities and the data warehouse quickly after that. Absolutely. So, yeah, so builds are, are basically uh, software versions. So you might have your own homegrown applications or or just regular enterprise applications, and you want to track the different versions you might have. Uh, and that brings us to the next one, which is environments. Um, so which versions of certain software do you have in your different environments? So you can define a, your production environment versus a, a software development or a test environment and, and keep better track of which builds are in which environments. And that obviously, you can see how that would relate back to release management with knowing when you're going to release new builds in, you know, from dev into test and through to production. And uh, I think we touched on there are new activity types. Um, you're familiar with review activities and manual activities if you're familiar with 2010. You will get review activities in service requests, which I think is important because as Nick had mentioned uh, in his example earlier, uh, certain requests are going to require some sort of approval. You're also going to be able to have sequential and parallel activities. These are actually two different kinds of activities, which are really more containers than they are activities themselves. Sequential activities are what you're used to, again, if you're familiar with 2010 in a change request. Activities have to happen in a certain sequence, whereas parallel activities are more like activities in incidents in 2010. They can happen in whatever order. And the dependent activities allow linking of activities to other work items. Um, we could probably do a presentation on changes, releases, and activities, and maybe we'll, we'll do that at some point in the future so that we could get into these in more detail. 
So now we get to the data warehouse and analytics. And Nick, if you could just give us a, a brief summary of this so we can then get on to the, uh, the implementation considerations. Yeah, absolutely. There's basically three things I sort of wanted to convey here. Um, first, that the data warehouse is, has been improved now to leverage SQL Server Analysis Services. And what that lets us do is create OLAP cubes. So OLAP cubes are pre-aggregated data that pull from multiple sources um, and, and present the data in a way that makes it easy to navigate and easy to, to build reports off of. Um, so the first big uh, sort of benefit that we get out of that is that there's no coding required. So you can open up tools you're familiar with, tools like Excel uh, or SharePoint, and connect to these OLAP cubes as an external data source. And just using like pivot table functionality, you can put together really rich reports that include not just raw data, but also metrics and KPIs that you can predefine. Um, and build pretty rich reports that, that are aesthetically appealing and, and publish those out then to SharePoint 2010. The other uh, improvement that's, that's been made is the data warehouse and service manager has become sort of the single system center 2012 data warehouse platform. So now instead of having your reporting in separate databases and separate logical systems between operations manager, config man, VMM, and service manager, you now have them all in the same logical application. So that means you can relate the data to each other in a way that you can do before. So you can, for instance, take a look. You always could look at the incidents that were created from Operations Manager and see how many of those you had compared to all of your incidents. But now you can look at how many alerts have been generated by Operations Manager in total. And you can very easily now get an incident to alert ratio, which is something that you, you couldn't have quite as easily put together in a single report before. Uh, and, and especially not with the drill through capabilities that you get uh, that the OLAP cubes enable for you. So it's much more rich features um, with reporting and an ability to build those rich features into reports without any coding. And I know that usually they say it's like no coding required, but you, you don't get a whole lot of functionality without the coding. Um, they really have done a good job with the OLAP cubes that ship out of the box and with new ones that you can create to, to develop really rich reports just in Excel. And, and there are some that ship. Uh, it's probably important to make that point. And there, there are some. There are, there are many that ship, and, and they're pretty robust uh, just in and of themselves. So. Cool. OK. So um, now we want to talk about implementation considerations. Um, and what we wanted to start with is just a, a real brief snapshot of the upgrade path. Uh, the supported path is an in-place upgrade. So a couple of things on this. Because it's an in-place upgrade, you're not going to need to migrate data. And your user roles, your unsealed management packs, and any custom reports that you might have built and published to SSRS are going to remain unchanged. Um, I think the challenge with an in-place upgrade for a production system, at least, is that you're presumably going to have a limited time window, because that is a production system. Uh, and obviously, there are some you know, considerations around just obviously how well planned it is, what the risk is to have upgrading a production system. We, we'll, we'll touch on that in, in a subsequent slide. Um, Nick, what about customizations? Because a lot of people have been asking about this. We've seen a lot of customers who are hesitant to customize Service Manager 2010 because of what might happen in a future version. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, and it depends on the type of customization. In, in general, any uh, extension you make to the schema, so anytime you add properties to an existing class or create new classes, those should survive the upgrade. Uh, there's, there's obviously always potential for, for risk there and, and exceptions, like if you've got a class that uses the same name as a class that's existing in the new product, uh, there could be a conflict there. But in general, if, if those conflicts don't exist, then your schema customizations will survive the upgrade. Uh, any custom workflows that you've built, same thing. Um, as long as there isn't conflict with existing customizations, those should survive. Although, because of the new functionality in Service Manager, you want to analyze what workflows you have running now. Because we've developed, um, for instance, around service requests, we've developed customizations and workflows to sort of support a service request process. And those are not going to be needed in the new version of the product because we have the service request work item. 
So in those cases, you, you want to analyze those and decide first whether they're going to be needed anymore or not. And then if they are, take a look and make sure that they're not going to conflict. And if they don't, they should still be there after the upgrade. Uh, the place where you are going to run into potential issues is with forms. If you've made any form customizations, as, as you've seen, changes have been made to the forms, um, and therefore some repositioning. The, the customizations themselves should survive, but the positioning of the fields and things you've added or changed might be different because the, the forms have changed. So you may need to go back and do some clean about you've done your upgrade. You'll want to check after the upgrade's complete all of the forms you've customized and, and see if you need to make any changes to the custom forms. Um, because the portal has been replaced, the existing portal uh, is not going to be upgraded. It's superseded by the new portal, which is based on SharePoint 2010. Then none of the customizations you've made to the portal are going to survive because that portal will just be deactivated and not used anymore. So those customizations will be lost. Um, so forms and portal aside, your customizations, and also as we touched on, unsealed management packs and configurations which should survive the upgrade. There's obviously, and we'll touch on the sort of upgrade scenario on the next slide, you want to make sure you, you plan and you have a, a disaster recovery or rollback plan in case things don't. Um, but in general, they, they've done the best I think that they could in terms of making sure that there's a, a limited amount of downtime between you know before, during, and after the upgrade. Um, yeah, the yeah, go on, Nick. Uh, okay, I was just going to move on to the next bullet. The other thing we wanted to, to touch on to make sure everyone was aware of was what the supported uh, upgrade path was in terms of versions. So if you're not in an early adoption or TAP program, uh, as of now, the only supported path for upgrade that will be supported in a production environment by Microsoft is the latest version of Service Manager 2010 to the release version of Service Manager 2012. So if you upgrade from 2010, for instance, to the 2012 beta, you'll lose production support for Service Manager. And you won't get it back if you upgrade from the beta to the release. You've got to go from 2010 uh, SP1 CU2 to the 2012 release of, of the version. So we wanted to make that clear. And also that during the upgrade, it is a big bang. Um, 2010 components are not compatible with 2012 components. So that's the management server, that's consoles, the portal, and the data warehouse all have to be on the same version. So you've got to upgrade all of those. Probably the biggest implication there is clients, just consoles, making sure you've rolled out so everyone's got the new console. Upgrading servers is higher risk, and it needs to do more planning, but it's probably less in terms of, of effort. Yeah, so let's look at the, the upgrade scenario here. Um, it's going to essentially mean having a 2012 lab to start with, and then designing your initial 2012 functionality, meaning what you want to go into production with, uh, which is going to uh, require that you figure out how to migrate anything that exists, and then how you're going to take use of new features. Just an example being you're handling service requests somehow today, obviously, outside of the service request work item that's going to exist in 2012. So there'll need to be some thought given to how you move from one to the other. And obviously, numbers three and four, you'll have to configure and test in, in the lab. You'll have to train in the lab. Um, training in the lab makes a lot of sense. The, the testing in the lab, obviously, you know, you're going to have to you're going to have some of the belief of faith that it's going to work in production when you upgrade. Um, obviously, planning becomes very, very important in terms of the schedule, all the different tasks, having a rollback, rollback plan, uh, uh, preparing for the hopefully unlikely, uh, in the unlikely event of a disaster. And then after you do the upgrade, um, and this is one I'd like Nick to address as well, you know, one of the things that we work with customers on is keeping um, as synchronized a lab environment and production environment as possible. And that's going to continue to be um, an important thing to do if you're going to have a 2012 lab and a 2012 production environment. So Nick, maybe you could just touch on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things, since you're going to have to apply new features after the upgrade, and that's sort of at the core of why we recommend having a lab environment where you can build in the new functionality, and then once the upgrade's done, you can migrate it over. Um, We've, we've dealt with that in the past for, for a number, a significant number of our, our clients where they've got a, 
uh, staging or development environment and they've got their production environment and they want to keep those as identical as possible. So we've developed a sort of management pack, custom management pack architecture strategy as a series of custom unsealed management packs where we can store and maintain the configurations in a way that makes it highly easy and highly predictable when we move configurations from one environment to another. Um, so in, internally, we're certainly looking at how we can leverage that um, to move in configurations from 2012 dev environment into the production environment, especially given the need to do that after the upgrade. Um, so that's been a pretty important strategy for us, just in terms of keeping the environments similar and reducing the amount of risk involved with, with migrating from one environment to another. So you can have some confidence that if it works in staging, it'll work in production. And I'm just going to jump ahead here to um, you know some of the the planning considerations. Um, you know this is as I mentioned earlier, 2010 is itself you know pretty pretty complex depending upon how much functionality that you want to use. And you know 2012 is going to be even more full featured and present potentially more complexity. There's lots of functionality. There are lots of potential solutions. It really is all that much more a platform. And, and we think it's really important with something like this that this be very objective driven. So what are we trying to do? What are the outcomes that we seek? Is it a reduction in cost, improvement in efficiency? Is it about end user, customer satisfaction? How are we going to measure those things? And therefore, how do we deploy this platform to help us achieve those things? The last bullet is what always comes to my mind. I, I think that there are a lot of folks that look at a resource like Service Manager 2012 uh, and think, look at all of the great stuff we can do. And they've got great aspirations, but they don't necessarily have an action plan that allows them to achieve those aspirations. And, and the, the action plan needs to be commensurate with the aspirations. The, the, the two need to, to line up. Um, we think of this like a roadmap, and, and it doesn't need to be something fancy, but it, it should be, it does need to be thought out, and it does need to be something that's done consciously. Um, one of the points that Nick makes pretty consistently is it's very, very possible to just take your 2012 environment, I'm sorry, 2010 environment, and upgrade it to 2012, um, and not necessarily use the new functionality. So you don't necessarily have to make full use of every feature in Service Manager 2012. Um, but if you do intend to make use of, the, of those features, you really do have to have some sort of a plan for it. And then, just to wrap up, two important points. This is a work management tool. Service Manager supports and automates work. So you really need to think about um, how you do work. There are lots of different ways of doing things. There really isn't an out-of-the-box blueprint. Um, the, the tool should provide some context as you're figuring out either how you want to work or how you might work. Uh, but you're going to have to make some decisions. And I think because of the increased flexibility in Service Manager 2012, it's going to put that much more emphasis on the organization to decide beforehand, OK, how do we actually want to do this, particularly when we're talking about work that crosses work groups in IT. And in, and in particular, uh, self-service, when you're starting to expect users to do more on their own. And a lot of that comes through um, what we've been talking about today, experimentation, exploration, installing the beta, getting uh, an idea of how it works, of what it does, getting some ideas about how you might use it, and then thinking about how we go from what we do today in 2010 to, to 2012. So I apologize. I've, I've raced through these past couple of slides in the interest of time just so we can accommodate a few questions. But, and I don't think that these are unique considerations to this particular application. I think you, know, you could apply these to a lot of different things. But I think they're, they're particularly important with where Service Manager is headed. So why don't we open it up to, to questions now. Do you have some, some questions, Dave? If folks are willing to hang on for a few minutes. Yeah, we've got, uh, we've got a number of questions from the floor. So well, let's start talking about um, 
And one thing I want to offer, if, if you're looking for more detail, you feel free to uh, email me. I'm Dave P at Acelerus.com. So it's D-A-V-E-P as in Peter at Acelerus.com. So, but the first question is, uh, what are the disadvantages of uh, implementing 2010 now instead of waiting and installing 2012? Uh, disadvantages? Yeah. Uh, I, I would say this, because I've had this question come up a few times recently. Um, you, you know, I think you have to make a decision about what, again, I go back to the previous slide, what are your objectives, what do you really need to do? Um, you're going to gain functionality in 2012. Um, the question that I would ask is, uh, is that functionality essential to your objectives, to your outcomes? Um, it might be great that you can do really granular uh, SLOs in 2012, if you don't have them today, or if you have very rudimentary SLOs today, I don't know that that's necessarily a, a blocker. Um, and back to, to Nick's point, you know, you can move to, you can upgrade from 2010 to, to 2012, meaning you can start in 2010 today and know that you're going to get everything in 2012 uh, when it's RTM. So I don't necessarily see a reason to wait if the functionality in 2012, the unique functionality in 2012, is not an essential objective for you. Uh, and Mark asks, um, are there other notification channels available other than SMTP? We've done, um, although using SMTP, we've uh, we've done um, text messages. But yeah, uh, I guess I'm not sure. No. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure if Mark has anything in in mind in particular. Nick, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't know that they've added any other notification channels to Service Manager. We can use, like like Pete said, email to send text messages. There's like Verizon and, and AT&T have, you know, ways of, of taking an email and sending that as a text to uh, somebody's phone. So we've, we've been able to, to work around that, but I'm not sure of any other channels that are going to be added other than SMTP at this point. I, don't, I wouldn't say we've fully uh, investigated that area of Service Manager 2012 as of yet, but, but not so far. Um. Uh, Dave asked, he's due to uh, SCSM, he, he wanted you to clarify uh, with regard to the Exchange Connector. Um, he thought you heard you say it was not officially supported. So what is the status of the Exchange Connector? Is it supported? Is it not for 2012? Uh, we don't, I, don't, I don't personally have an, an official answer to that. I haven't seen anything publicly announced by Microsoft in terms of, of its support. I know that it, it isn't available at all in any version for the beta. Um, but it is in, it's still in development uh, and will hopefully be ready by, by the release of Service Manager 2012. But unfortunately at this time, in terms of whether Microsoft will officially support it or not, we don't have a definite yes or no on that. Yeah, I would expect so, but yeah, you're, you're right to yeah. yeah, it's probably worth noting that we've used it with just about every client that we've dealt with since it was released. So it's it's pretty well proven. I, I wouldn't let the lack of support necessarily, you know, turn somebody off to, to using it because it really yeah. has nice functionality. And I, and to clarify too, lack of support I think boils down to you can't open a premier support case if the exchange connector is broken, but it's still developed and distributed by Microsoft. So there's still channels into Microsoft with which you can get help if you're having problems with it. Um, so it isn't like if it's broken you're on your own. You can still get some help. It's just not through the, the typical Microsoft support channels. And then I got a question from Jan. Um, the web or uh, console, can you, is it, is it, does it provide similar functionality um, uh, as a normal console, so the SharePoint uh, portal console? Well, there, there is no web console. There is the portal. Uh, and the portal is, has, is pretty full featured in terms of how you can interact with Service Manager through it. So you can do lots of things that you couldn't do before, um, things like create and manage work items. Um, it isn't as full featured as the console is, and I, I would still say that you're probably obliged to still roll out a console to everyone who's going to need full access to Service Manager. 
Although since it is based on the, the SharePoint platform and, and SharePoint is, is pretty extensible in its, in its own right, you could probably build some you know, customizations to bridge the gap where needed. Um, but yeah, in general, it's not. Yeah. Yeah, it's not the case that it's like uh, OA and uh, and Outlook Flat Client where they're they're similar. Um, there is a third-party solution um, that's available. Patrick Sunfist, I don't know the name of it, but basically that provides a mobile solution or a, 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 a web console, which is more full-featured. Yeah, it's called Grid Pro. I don't know what their plans are for support in, in 2012. So it's about yeah. 2010 now, yeah. Okay. Um, Andrew, um, yeah, this, his question is, again, what can and can't be done with what with, they're calling the web client. I'll, I'll clarify and say there is no web client per se. There's a SharePoint portal which can be accessed via the web and provides some functionality, but it certainly isn't a, you know, as OA is to the fact um, Outlook client. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it'd be worth just saying, I, I think the intended use for the portal centers primarily around, um, th there's two things. From an end user perspective, it centers primarily, and there are other things, but from my perspective, it's primarily around the, the ability to request services through the request offerings. So um, you, you build in your service catalog these request offerings, and those appear as links that folks can click on and provide information, and that will create a service request and service manager that can then get assigned out to somebody. Um, so from an end user point of view, that's, that's sort of the primary role of it, although it, it can handle other things as well. So. So um, Dave is asking, uh, end users looking to submit self-service tickets will do so via the web interface in the SharePoint portal, right? That's correct, absolutely. Okay. Um, Hejman is asking, uh, where can we get the recording? Uh, the recording, when, once this is done, um, it will be uh, posted at the registration site, but I will uh, make sure that uh, everyone who's registered will get uh, uh, that uh, link set out again to them. Uh, this is Dave. Uh, let's see who else. Uh, are you, uh, another question is, are you working on Service Manager 2012 Unleashed? Uh, that's the book. As you, as you may know, we, we uh, were co-authors of the Service Manager 2010 Unleashed book. If you haven't seen that, uh, really worth taking a look because it helps you uh, uh, structure how your approach. Um, but uh, the answer is right now is right not no. I just finished two other books. I'll <laughs> take a little bit of a breather. Uh, I, I, there's some back and forth as to when that would uh, commence. Um, Ava asks, is the parent-child feature new in 2012? Parent-child uh, incidents are new in 2012. So the ability to, to have a parent incident with multiple children is a new feature. Yeah. Okay. And Michael asks, at incident SLA, does the status pending affect the target end time? Yeah, you know, I, that's a good question. I just started testing that um, because I wanted to understand whether you could actually pause the target. Um, I'd be happy to uh, to follow up on that with the uh, with everybody who attended. Maybe we can clarify that because I, I'm still I did not have a chance to really look into that thoroughly, and I want to understand that. Okay, Pete. Um, Wilson's got a question, and it's around the authoring tool. It hasn't been streamlined right now. It's it's kind of kludgy. Um, the, the navigating the stack panels is just currently very confusing. Any streamlining there? Uh, I've I've only looked at the the authoring tool a little bit since we since it's been released with the beta. Um, at the moment, it's it'll be very familiar to you if you've used the the authoring tool in the current version. So, and especially with stack panels and things like that. At this point, it doesn't look uh, exceptionally different. So it's been upgraded to, to work with the new work items and things and forms that are available. Um, but so far, in general, in terms of working with the tool, it, it'll be pretty familiar to you. Okay. Uh, let's see what else we've got. Um, OK. Dave, is there a separate end user portal and analyst portal in 2012? Uh, there's not. So there's, there's just a single portal now. Um, and the content that an individual sees in the portal is controlled by their user role. So it's a single portal that can have lots and lots of different things on it. But you control what, what buttons people get to see and what they get to click on through user roles. So, But just a single portal at this point. Okay. 
And, and so, so Nick, that could end up meaning a lot more user roles. I mean, we typically do a series of custom user roles for people within IT, but we're now potentially talking about um, end users also having custom user roles. If, for example, you didn't want people outside of HR to have all of the same request offerings that people in HR have. Absolutely. Uh, there's going to be much more planning. If you're going to use the full service catalog functionality, you'll need to plan for how you're going to give access to your end users. So for everyone in the business, obviously different folks will have different levels of, of permissions and, and what they can access. Uh, and that's all going to have to be planned and built into Service Manager. And uh, Andrew asks, um, you know, last version you could post announcements on the portals. Is that gone from the, the new SharePoint portal? I believe that it is, yeah. I don't think that announcements are built into the existing portal at this time. Another thing that's been sort of taken out is the software request process. So you're no longer going to have a, a link. And, th and this is at this point. This may change between now and the release. But at this point, uh, there's no request offer button. The functionality, the workflows, are still in Service Manager. Uh, so you can still trigger them, but it's it's not there as a button by default in the portal when you install it. Yeah, just some clarification. On the announcements, there's a functionality built into the SharePoint for that. So their, their thought is that you can use that widget versus uh, them having to stand up their own. So um, next question, Stephen. Uh, uh, do you guys ever work with the service catalog? Is it, uh, and then second is also, is it safe to install SCOM and SCSM 2012 data warehouse on one instance? Uh, on the same server? No. Um, they, they have different management groups, and because of that, they need to be on different, uh, like, virtual servers. Um, you can certainly have them on the same host, but they have to be hosted, they have to be separate servers because of the management group, and they share bits and some things like that. Uh, actually, now that I say that, I think operations manager and server service manager might be able to coexist, but I don't think it's recommended. For, for testing environments, though, certainly service manager and the data warehouse need to be separated out. Uh, yeah, any of these questions where we have to uh, do a little uh, further investigating, we'd be happy to follow up on uh, with a definitive answer at another time. So. Um, uh, Wilson's asking, is there any way to provide CMDB info through the portal? Um, well, I guess, yes. I, I think, in general, yes, you can provide CMDB info through the portal. You can provide data warehouse info through the portal. I think you would want to clarify specifically what data uh, he was trying to surface and, and how and why. But in general, you've got the ability to, to surface lots of different things on the portal in, in different ways. Dave asks, does the product allow for the creation of branched workflows based on a series of questions, like a workflow wizard? I think he's talking about logic. Well, you know, it's it's uh, you could pop up a form and say, if it's this, if it's that. You know, I'm thinking of a move, add, and change, where based on this criteria, it'll branch this way. Based on the answers to this form, it'll branch that way. Um, yeah, you know, example, um, yeah. I don't, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, I don't believe it's quite that sophisticated. It, it's not. It's a flat list of questions. Uh, and, and if we're talking about um, on the portal when we're presenting, you know, fields to users to populate when they're creating a request or an incident through the portal, it's just a flat list and they're not interdependent. So if somebody says, you know, this is based on an answer to one question, it won't change the following questions that are asked. So what that means is you have to do some careful planning around the types of uh, request offerings you're going to surface so you can make sure that you're categorizing at that level. So instead of having one offering saying, I need a new piece of software, um, if you'd have different questions you need to ask for different kinds of software, you would want those to be different request offerings. Yeah, I think you also have to think about how they're going to get handled after they're submitted. Uh, if I go in and I we, we have a, a customer that handles um, accounts differently depending upon whether the person is an employee, a contractor, a U.S. citizen, a non-U.S. citizen, um, you could theoretically, as Nick said, have different request offerings for those scenarios. Um, you couldn't combine all of that together on the front end 
Uh, well, I guess you could if it, with different selections, but then you, what you couldn't do, I don't believe, within the activities is drive different branches based on different responses. I, I, you, you perhaps could do it with some workflow, but there is no, there's no logic within, um, within review work activities that can send things one way or the other. Yeah, thanks for hanging in there with us. We've got one more question. It's from Terry. How do we integrate VMM with Service Manager? VMM seems to have quite a bit of self-service already. You know, physical servers get left behind, though. Can Service Manager bridge the gap? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think we're still uh, investigating what the possibilities are when you connected Service Manager with VMM. I think where we're at so far with the integration between those two products is that we're getting data from VMM into Service Manager into the CMDB, which gives us uh, a better insight into what's going on uh, with our virtual machines. Most of the integration in terms of, of workflow happen via Orchestrator. Um, there's also this uh, Microsoft Concero portal that's used to, to manage and maintain virtual machines as well. And, and we don't have a really solid understanding of when the Service Manager portal is uh, used and when the Concero portal is used or, or where their functionality overlaps or, or what the gap is there. So we could certainly do some more investigation and probably provide a, a more solid answer to that as we as we start to delve deeper into that piece of integration. That was a question from Dave, and I'll, I'll end with this one. Can you talk about the integration with the, uh, with the knowledge base? Is it built one into the product, or can you integrate with the external, like in SharePoint? The answer is yes. I mean, even the current product, 2010, there's a built-in knowledge base, um, and you can link to external data sources, including TechNet, uh, or to uh, your own uh, knowledge bases in SharePoint uh, through a linking feature. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, wrap the, the questions. I want to say thanks for hanging in with us. As I, as I mentioned, in the handout section of the, of the live meeting, in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see three pieces of paper sort of put on, on top of each other. That's where the uh, PDF of this presentation is posted. I will follow up with all attendees with uh, the recording of this, a link to the recording, so that you can have that as well. I want to thank you for attending. I want to thank uh, both Pete and Nick for their um, uh, presentation. I, uh, I do appreciate it. If you have further questions, you can contact me at stapletorek. Uh, Dave P., as in Peter, at Accelerus.com. Thanks.